please stop pretending that the solution to rape culture and violence against women is that we need to educate guys about boundaries. I mean, if we really, really believe that there are men and boys in our society who believe, earnestly believe, that it's okay to grope women, sexually harass women, assault women and rape women, shouldn't we be asking where the hell have they got that idea from? And, I mean, first up, maybe we should be asking that. And stamping it out, right? And, you know, there's an extent to which you're hearing this from the original comedian in Britain who thought Keith Lemon might be a frickin' problem. But it, it is a fact that we live in a culture that absolutely normalises stalking women, bothering women, creeping around after women. And that happens in our media, it happens in mainstream media. And we should also be talking about the impact that violent pornography has on men across our culture. And, you know, sitting there and lighting a candle is a wonderful way to memorialise someone, but if we actually want things to change, we might have to have difficult conversations about things like violent pornography. But more importantly, I honestly don't believe that men don't know this. And I think this whole, like, let's educate men, it's giving off sort of, um, it's giving off vibes that legitimise the naivety defence, and we've all heard it. Guys doing things and then going, oh, I didn't know that was a problem. There's a report in the British Medical Journal um, about young people in heterosexual relationships having anal sex, and they ask what motivated them to choose to have anal sex. And one of the main reasons given is, it was an accident. I'm like, I'm sorry, but I've been clumsy in my lifetime. I think a lot of us have. but. I don't think clumsy enough that I accidentally anally penetrated someone. Anal sex never happens by accident, and anyone who tells you that it does is a rape apologist. You don't have an ass like a fucking windsock. It's, it's just, does it beg us belief? And yet we allow men and boys to get away with this, oh, I didn't know if this was okay, I didn't know, I didn't know this. And telling girls that they have the right to say no message, I'm sorry, but it really undersells your power as a woman. Like, I don't want to have the kind of sex where the guy starts doing things or tells me what he's gonna do, and my role is to just say no when it all gets a bit too much for me. Like, I want to have the kind of sex where we decide together what we want to do based on me actually also having a sex drive and desires and needs. And the bottom line is that feminists have been saying this for years. This is not new news, but because we don't teach young people about feminism, about the history of women's rights, and because we don't take that subject seriously and discuss it in the media in real depth, and because older women in our society who have experienced it for years and years and years are so easily dismissed on the slightest whim, we have a situation where something comes around, like the murder of Sarah Everard, like the abuse of girls in schools, which is now coming to light, like rape in the Australian Parliament, uh, like the murder of Delini Yahansa in Sri Lanka, and people look around and there's like an upswelling of, oh my goodness, this is terrible, we must do something about this. But we come back to it from like Feminism 101, rather than joining the movement of our foremothers and the very proud tradition of it. And what we actually need to do is not educate boys about what consent is and this sort of like basic 101. What we need is to educate everybody in our society about the history of the struggle for women's equality and the wins and the losses and the battleground that it is and listen to the voices of, radically enough, middle-aged women. So give yourself 10 brownie points for listening to this one and listen to some more. And let's try to have this ongoing battle in context because that is how we will actually achieve real change. See you next week.